Hey guys, here we are for section two where we're going to talk about the atmosphere. Once again, we're just addressing those various layers of the earth, and here we go. Essential question. I want you to be able to explain the three mechanisms of heat transfer within the earth's atmosphere. The atmosphere, first key term. It's just a mixture of gases that surround a planet such as Earth. Obviously, Jupiter, Neptune, Venus have thick atmospheres around them, and we have an atmosphere around us. Mars, Moon, Mercury, very little to almost no atmosphere. But gases can be added and removed through living organisms. Like, I am taking oxygen out of the air, and I'm putting carbon dioxide into the air. Plants are taking carbon dioxide out of the air and putting oxygen into the air. Gases can be added to and from living organisms. Also, the Earth's natural processes, like volcanic eruptions, these add gases into the atmosphere. And vehicles both add and remove gases. If you're using a typical car, well, it is taking oxygen out of the air because it's a combustion process, right? We need oxygen for burning. It's taking oxygen out of the air and it's putting carbon dioxide and nitrous oxides into the air. All of these things both take away and add. A forest fire is going to take oxygen out of the air and put carbon dioxide in as it burns. So lots of things affect how the atmosphere is made and what it consists of. Now our atmosphere, specifically on the Earth, we're gonna reference, insulates our surface. This insulation slows the rate at which our surface loses heat and it keeps the Earth's temperature at which things can survive. Once again, the greenhouse effect is a good thing, but too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. So we need the greenhouse effect. We need the greenhouse gases because they help to insulate the planet and keep it warm. Without them, as soon as it got nighttime, all the heat would escape out and it would stay too cold. It wouldn't get warmed up enough during the day. The gases act as an insulation and it keeps our heat in because the moon right nearby at any given point does not have liquid water on it. It has water, but it remains frozen. So without our atmosphere, the earth wouldn't remain warm enough for you and I to have life. Now let's look at the composition of the atmosphere. How much carbon dioxide is in our atmosphere? What do you think? Two, three, four percent. If you're thinking that, it's actually way off. We talk about it a lot, but nitrogen is about 78% of our atmosphere. And I'll put the diagram here. Oxygen, about 21%. Now this can change slightly depending on your altitude and how close you are to sea level, but roughly 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, leaving us 1% for everything else, including our carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is only part of that 1%. Argon makes about 0.93 of that 1%. Carbon dioxide, 0.03%. It's a very small percentage, but it's an important greenhouse gas because it's one of these that re-radiates the heat back in. We talk about it a lot, because it is the one that humans have the most influence in. When we talk about the greenhouse gases, then we're gonna talk about four. The most important one is water vapor. Now, when you look this up, a lot of times they don't add water vapor. Like we're talking about this nitrogen 78, oxygen 21, other 1%. Water vapor is not thrown in that mix because water vapor can actually be about 4% of the atmosphere at any point in time especially if you're in Florida and it's kind of a humid. Now in Arizona, it might be less, maybe like 1%, but water is a very important part of it, which often they don't put into these mixes. But for our purposes, test questions, etc., 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, then it gets down to the others. But carbon dioxide is only about 0.03%. 
just a very small amount, all things considered. Air pressure. You and I walking around the planet Earth, we don't really feel air pressure, but it's here. Gravity is pulling everything towards the center of the planet. You, me, and the oxygen and nitrogen molecules up there. So as a result of this, our atmosphere is denser at the surface of the planet, where you and I are walking around, than it is up into the atmosphere. Like where planes fly, the atmosphere is very thin. So when you see in the movies and the window breaks and people get sucked out of the plane, it's because the plane is keeping high pressure, like it is down here at the surface, and they pressurize the plane and we fly up high, it's very low pressure. So if a window opens, it goes from high pressure to low pressure very quickly. It shoots out. That's why you see it. But we're accustomed to the high pressure of living down at the surface of the earth. So the higher up we go, the less dense the air becomes and makes breathing at higher elevations more difficult. When people climb Mount Everest, most of them take oxygen tanks with them because there's a certain point there's so little oxygen you can't survive very long a day or two but you get in trouble very quickly let's talk about the layers of the atmosphere just like we talked about the layers in the earth we have layers of the atmosphere and they're dividing based on temperature changes so we're saying why did we so we have the troposphere, the stratosphere, the mesosphere, the thermosphere. You think, well, what, what's the difference? What makes the line? The line is where the temperature begins to change. Well, I'm going to throw a graph up here just so we can kind of look at, well, not really a graph, but a picture of them. Now, what happens in the troposphere, this is where all the weather is, what happens is the temperature, the higher up you go, gets colder and colder and colder and colder. And then when you hit the stratosphere, then the temperature starts to get warmer, 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 warmer until we hit the mesosphere. And then it begins to get colder, colder, colder until we hit the uh, thermosphere where it starts to get hotter, hotter, hotter again. So this is the line. Why we decide where the line on is when the temperature begins to shift from getting colder to warmer to colder to warmer again. So we have these four and let's talk about them in order from the ground up. The troposphere. This is the lowest layer. This is where you and I live and have our being. This is almost where all the weather conditions on the planet exist within the troposphere. Very little weather is occurring above the troposphere into the stratosphere. It is the densest atmospheric layer of all the ones we talk about, and it only extends about 18 kilometers up. You can give or take, whether it's a high pressure day or a low pressure day, but give take about 18 kilometers from the ground to the top of the troposphere. So this is our lowest layer, and you need to have a key fact for each one of these. This is where the weather, lowest, densest, and where our weather occurs. That's the troposphere. The next layer up, the stratosphere. The stratosphere is right above the troposphere, and it's about from 18 kilometers to about 50 kilometers. This is where the temperature rises quickly because of our ozone layer. The ozone absorbs the sun's ultraviolet rays, the UV rays, and it then warms the air. As it captures the energy from the sun, it re-radiates it there. So the ozone layer is why it begins to warm up in the stratosphere. Cold, 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 it begins to warm out. I think as it's incredibly cold, it doesn't get very warm, but it begins to warm up. Stratosphere, second layer, has the ozone layer in it, and it's the re-radiation of the sun's energy and the ozone that causes it to warm up. Now, ozone is a molecule made up of three oxygen. What you and I breathe is O2, ozone is O3. And almost all the ozone in the atmosphere is concentrated in the stratosphere. We do have some ozone that happens down here on the earth. We'll talk about it in later chapters when we talk about the air and air pollution. But almost all the ozone in our atmosphere does exist in the stratosphere. And because 
it absorbs this UV radiation, it removes much of that or it protects us. It acts like a huge sunscreen so that you and I don't get too much UV radiation. UV radiation is what causes us to get sunburned. It can cause skin cancer and as it can harm us, it can harm other organisms, especially things like amphibians, which are very sensitive to amounts of UV radiation. The ozone layer winds up as a protective shield, keeping a high amounts of UV radiation down, once again, making life on the planet accessible or available or possible, one of those. The next layer is the mesosphere. Third layer up, troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere. This goes up to about 80 kilometers, so somewhere between 50 and 80 kilometers up. This is the coldest layer of the atmosphere. Temperatures is below at negative 93 Celsius. So within our own atmosphere, this is the coldest layer. The other interesting fact about it is no mesosphere equals doom. The mesosphere is where most of the dust meteors burn up in the atmosphere. It's thick enough that as these things begin to fall through it, they begin to burn up there. It gives them time to begin to burn up. So as they make it in the thicker atmosphere, they're already on fire and they disappear. Without the mesosphere, we would be impacted by much more in the way of meteor meteorites making it through the planet. Most of the soft ones like rock burn up before they get here. Only the really dense ones, typically that have high concentration of metals in there, make it all the way down to the planet. And the mesosphere is what protects us from meteors for the most part. Lastly is the thermosphere. What last one we're going to talk about. This is the farthest from the Earth's surface. The atmosphere is incredibly thin here, but the nitrogen and the oxygen absorb the solar radiation and the temperatures can measure above 2000 degrees. However, the air is so thin, these individual particles rarely come in contact with each other. So even if you were up there, it wouldn't feel hot to you because there's not enough of these particles to hit or impact you at any given time. Very, very thin in that point. The ions up here, ions are just where you have a atom and it is either gained or lost an electron. In this case, when we have they gain electrons, the energy coming through them causes the electrons to excite, go to a higher energy level, and this can radiate as light energy. And this light can glow in very spectacular fashions at our North and South Poles, where we call it, at least in the North Pole, the Aurora Borealis. So the thermosphere is where we get our Aurora Borealis or the Northern Lights. So with each one, make sure you know where it is in its relationship with the others and make sure you know a couple of facts about them. Now, energy transfer. So we talked about heat. So the picture we have up here is kind of showing that thing of the temperature gets colder, 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 then it hits the stratosphere, gets warmer, 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 till it hits the mesosphere, colder, 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 till it hits the thermosphere. Now, Energy in the form of heat has to get transferred into these particles. And there's three way energy gets transferred in the atmosphere. We have radiation. Radiation is being transferred as electromagnetic waves. You now electromagnetic waves are radio wave, microwave, infrared, visible light, uh, ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma ray. So any one of these electromagnetic waves can travel in the form of radiation. So they travel across distances. Then we have conduction. Conduction is where you touch it. This is where I put my hand, ow, that's hot. Conduction. So radiation travels across space. Conduction is physically touching it. So one particle is touching another and transfers the heat or convection. Convection is the movement of matter due to their different densities. Warm air rises and it cools off and then it falls. So a convection is a current. These are the three ways energy can get transferred. Radiation comes through and it warms up a particle. If another particle touches that warm particle, it can transfer the heat. These warm particles can then rise 
and cool off and I get a convection current. So heat can be transferred up through convection. But these are the only three methods of energy transfer that occur in the atmosphere and anywhere else, really. Now, how our atmosphere gets warm. We talk about global warming, we talk about the greenhouse effect and how it contains its energy. How does the atmosphere actually get warmed? Solar energy reaches the planet as electromagnetic radiation. Once again, one of these forms. For the most part, it comes as infrared, visible, and ultraviolet. So these are the main ones that come that affect us in any terms of heat. So about half of the solar energy that enters the atmosphere passes through it and reaches the Earth's surface. So the sun's coming through, but it has to come through all of this atmosphere. So some of that light winds up getting absorbed by a particle, reflected away from the planet Earth. So it's coming through the atmosphere, lots of particles are absorbing it and re-rating it before it can really get close enough to you and I to warm the planet and other bits just get reflected so that energy, that radiation can't make it to the planet. So about 50% makes it through. Remember, the ozone layer up there blocking a lot of the UV light. Too much UV, we have more damage. The rest of the energy makes it down here and that is what begins to warm our planet. Our planet doesn't continue to get warmer and warmer and warmer because the ocean and the land re-radiates that heat back into the atmosphere. So you know you wake up in the morning and you walk across the parking lot to go get your mail and you're barefoot and it feels cool. You go out and you're barefoot at 12 o'clock in the afternoon and you're oh, hot, oh, hey. you're doing the hot dance. You, you can't put your feet on it. And then back again in the evening at 8 o'clock, it's cool again. So that asphalt heats up very quickly, but it also re-radiates that heat back up into the atmosphere. Well, that heat makes it back up into the atmosphere, and this is what helps temperate the temperature of the planet. Dark colored objects like asphalt absorb a lot more solar energy than light colored objects, and they have therefore more energy to release as heat. So this is one reason that we tend to have higher temperatures in cities, we call them heat islands, is because of all this asphalt, this black, they tend to be darker than the surrounding countryside, which is green and doesn't have these types of materials. Sunlight comes through, about 50% makes down, it hits the earth, hits the particles, the earth warms up, re-radiates that back up into the air or the atmosphere. Now, it is this continual process of warm air rising, remember the convection currents, and the cool air sinking that moves the air in a convection current. This is what we really know of as wind. The air rises, it cools, it falls. So down here where it's warming and rising, this is wind for us. So as a current of air that gets warmed by the Earth's surface rises, it cools, gets more dense, this moves back towards the Earth until it gets heated and less dense and again. And this convection current moving the warm air around is largely responsible for keeping it warm and temperate along with the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is a warming of the surface of the lower atmosphere, mainly the troposphere and some in the stratosphere. This is where the carbon dioxide, the water vapor, and the other gases absorb the energy and re-radiate the heat. So the heat comes up and the carbon dioxide can absorb the heat and then it slowly gives that heat back off. It acts as insulation. Without the greenhouse effect, life would be impossible on planet Earth as you and I know it because it would stay below freezing all of the time. These gases trap the heat and re-radiate it back out. So it warms up on the Earth, mainly down on the ground. That heat rises in a convection current, warming up the particles in the air. They hold on to the heat, and then when the sun goes away at nighttime, they release that heat back out into the atmosphere, keeping us warm. The most abundant, the big four that we'll talk about. Water vapor is the biggest greenhouse gas and the most important one to keep us warm. Then carbon dioxide, then methane, then nitrous oxide. 
It's the largest amount and the most important carbon dioxide. Methane, uh, pound for pound, if you will, is the biggest one. It can absorb the most heat, but there's very little of it in the atmosphere. So the big four, water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide. None of these exist in high concentrations. Water would be the potential, but compared to nitrogen oxygen, very little. But it is these quantities that, and it varies considerably because of just natural, we have a volcano eruption, we have more gases in the air. We have a forest fire, at least more gases in the air. But it's this aspect of industries just continuously running and burning carbon dioxide, well, burning coal, releasing carbon dioxide that has us concerned. That wraps it up for the atmosphere. Come back next time when we look at the hydrosphere and a quick look at biosphere. Take care, guys.